Jim White is a native Delawarean and a graduate of the University of Delaware. He has worked for the Delaware Nature Society for 39 years, currently serving as Senior Fellow for Land and Biodiversity Management. He has led many natural history field trips to the woodlands, mountains, and coastal areas of the Eastern US and New World tropics. In addition to insects, amphibians, and reptiles, Jim is also keenly interested in birds, especially the owls. He has led many field trips in pursuit of owls and through his photography presents owl programs throughout our area. We're lucky to have Jim with us tonight to give us one of those owl programs. So at this point, I will turn things over to Jim to get us started. Jim, thanks for being with us. Oh, you're welcome, Amy. Thank you very much. It's great. It's great being here. Um, I wish we were in person, but this is uh, this should work fairly well. So I'm going to share my screen, uh, do this technical stuff that Amy is real good at, and I'm not so good at. Uh, let's see. For some reason, I'm still seeing you there. You're not seeing me. Are you just see my screen, Amy? I am seeing your screen. Yes. Okay, great. Oops. Fortunately, I'm still seeing you. I gotta, I gotta get rid of you. So. <laughs> And me, I'm looking at myself and you and me. Okay, so let me stop that share again. Try one more. Yep, no problem. Okay. So I'm here tonight um, to talk about a bird, a type of birds, and I'm very interested in. I've been kind of uh, interesting in them since I started birding about 45 years ago. Uh, and by the turnout tonight, I think a lot of people are interested in owls. So I'm gonna give you a little overview of the owls of the Mid-Atlantic States, um, talk a little bit about their natural history, talk about where they may be found, and, um, and a little bit about what they sound like. So I think everybody knows an owl. If I were to show a person a photo of an owl uh, in Central Park, I bet 100 people would just be able to say that's an owl. They're very recognizable. Uh, in my slide here on the left, uh, there's the largest owl in the world, the blackest fishing owl. And it stands about uh, two feet tall. It's not really huge, but it's a pretty good sized bird. The bird to the right is the smallest owl, and it's the elf owl. It stands about four inches. So although their size is very, very different, they still look somewhat alike. They have a couple things in common. They have this big, relatively big for the body head, and it's usually either blocky or round. They also have very large eyes that are forward facing, very similar to our head. They also have a beak that resembles kind of a nose. So they look very human-esque in my mind anyway. And in many cultures, owls play a large part in their mythology and some of their beliefs. Um, you've heard the wise owls. Um, I know in Ireland, the owl signifies death. In other countries, it can signify um, many, many other things, but they're very, very commonly um, utilized in diff by different cultures. Again, here's just that, again, another species of owl, but it still has a very similar look to it. Large eyes. Of course, the eyes are, um, are very large compared to the head, uh, compared to our eyes. I want to show you a couple of things. Their eyes are large, but they're very different than human eyes or for most mammals. Um, in other birds. Their eyes are fixed in the sockets. And if you look, uh, there's a bone called an ocular bone that goes right around the eyeball and actually holds those eyes in place. So when an owl needs to look right, left, up, or down, it has to move its head that way. The eyes are always forward facing. One of the adaptations owl ha owls have to deal with that is they're able to twist their heads they can spin their heads as much as 300 degrees. Not all the way around, but a long way around. So if you ever watch an owl in the wild, you're going to notice that they, they, they turn their head a lot because that's how they have to adjust their vision. 
another interesting trait in owls, as opposed to in um, most animals, their ears, well, like most animals, the ears are on the side of the head. My cursor will work here, right there. However, they're asymmetrical. If you notice these arrows, these arrows are signifying the placement of the ears on this barn owl's head. So they're not at the same plane. One is higher than the other. And this is important for owls. Owls have the ability, unlike humans and a lot of mammals, to pinpoint the actual location where sound is coming from. This is important for owls because they hear, they, um, they hunt primarily through uh, hearing. So they're listening for their prey. And these asymmetrical ears will allow them to tell how far uh, a prey is from them. So they can easily tell if it's right or left. We can do that. If we hear a sound, we know exactly where, what, what plane it's coming from. We'll turn our head and look right at it. However, our ears are so symmetrical that we don't hear well enough to know exactly where that animal is. And if you've ever gone out and tried to find a, a little sound like a cricket or a um, Katie did or a frog, you'll see how difficult it is to actually find them. Where owls are very good at this. In fact, barn owls have been proven to be able to hunt in complete darkness. Now, owls cannot see in complete darkness, but they're able to hunt and find their prey just by hearing. Another ad adaptation for owls are these little tips on the wing. You have to picture a, a, a bird's wing out flying and the leading edge of that wing, the, the edge that's hitting the wind first, um, was, is what creates the lift so a bird can fly or an airplane or whatever, whatever aerodynamic um, entity. So, but owls have these little feather-like structures, these little fern-like structures on the leading edge of that wing. It's the only bird that has that. And those little fern-like structures break up the vortexes that can form going over a wing. And this allows owls to fly completely silent. And if any of you have ever been outside at night or in the daytime, if you've seen an owl fly, or if it's flown near you, you will, I'm sure you did not hear it unless it hit a branch or something. They're really, really quiet. And this That adaptation of these little frills on the leading edge of that wing allow that to happen. Now owls, it's important that owls fly very quietly or silent. One, we used to think it was mainly so they could sneak up on their prey. In other words, their prey would not hear them coming. But recent studies have shown that the main reason, the primary reason that the owls fly silent is so that they don't make noise when they're flying and it doesn't disrupt their own hearing. So in other words, there's no background sound. So they can easily pinpoint the sound of a mouse or, or whatever's running through the vegetation. So a very important adaptation for, for owls, flying silent. And it's really neat if you ever get one to fly over your head. Another trait that owls have and I have, a, I have just a drawing here of a burrowing owl, which is a very small owl, and a very large owl called the snowy owl. And you can see their feet are very similar. We call them talons. And these are uh, used to grab and hold on to prey, because these are all predators. All the owls are predators. Now there are hawks and eagles, the diurnal raptors also have these, this type of foot. Another neat thing I think is pretty cool is how uh, owls digest their food. Owls tend to eat their food whole, especially if they're eating relatively small prey, like meadow voles, white-footed mice, even um, things like rats. They just got, they just swallow it down whole. And in doing that, they swallow a lot of undigestible material. And in this case, you'll see a skull. So bones are not digestible. And then all the fur from that rodent, in this case, a meadow bull. So this collects in their, in their uh, stomach and then is regurgitated in a pellet form. You may have heard of pellets. These are two pellets of uh, uh, barn owls. And they basically are just little packets of fur and bone. And you, you'll see I dissected a few of them and I got was able to get, find the skulls and the uh, 
the lower mandibles of the of the. And you can find all the bones in the mice, and you can actually articulate it. It's pretty pretty neat. I'll talk a little bit more about pellets when we get to uh, finding owls. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna, tonight I'm going to primarily talk about eight species of owls. Starting at the top on the left is the eastern screech owl, great horned owl, the barn owl, the barred owl. These four owls are residents of our area, the mid-Atlantic. So in other words, they stay here year round. Therefore, they nest here, rear their young. Bottom four, starting on the left, the short-eared owl, the long-eared owl, and the saw wet owl, and the snowy owl are all winter visitors. They typically nest north of here, north and west of here. Some of them up in the Arctic, and we'll talk about that, like the snowy owl, others in the boreal uh, forest, and some actually not too far in, uh, up in Pennsylvania, in the um, northern part of Pennsylvania, New York and other states up there in Vermont. So we're gonna go through each one of these, kind of, you know, give you a little information on each one. We'll start with the, probably the most common owl in our area, maybe the, I would say the most commonly encountered anyway, is the Eastern Screech Owl. They're found everywhere where there's a little bit of forest. Um, they're especially common around streams and ponds. And they don't usually, they hang around the edge of forest, not deep in the interior. But they're usually hunting in open grounds. They're hunting mice, white-footed mice or meadow voles. Sometimes they hunt birds. But the Eastern Screech Owl comes in two different color forms. The red phase, this one here, or better term is the red morph. It spends its entire life as a red morph, this guy. And the gray morph. So they can come in either color. Now they do, they can interbreed. They're the same species. Uh, they typically don't interbreed very much, but when they do, sometimes you'll get a kind of an intergrade. You'll get a reddish gray and vice versa. Screech owls are cavity birds. They, they roost in cavities during the daytime and they nest in cavities. So that's holes in trees. Um, and they also go into human made nest boxes or other structures. And this is a shot in my backyard of, of our nest box. And you can notice, you see the box, and it doesn't look that unusual, but there's no big black hole here where the hole would be. Something's sitting in there. And this is what it is. It's a roosting Eastern screech owl. These screech owls will be in there all day. And sometimes if you position your box right, uh, I, I like to position them west, so it's getting the setting sun, but around 3.30 in the winter time, they'll sometimes come up into the entrance of the box and sun and just sit there and warm up before it gets dark. And then of course they go out to hunt. There's another one. And they're all usually squinting at you because um, they, if they open their eyes too wide, it kind of gives them away. They blend in a lot better with their eyes closed. They're looking through it, through the slits. Here's inside one of those boxes. I opened it up and, and looked in and here's a red faced screech owl sitting there squinting at me. And you notice he has two prey items here. These are meadow voles. And apparently the night before I opened that box, he, he or she was out hunting and was able to find even some extras to bring back and kind of stash in the box and it'll eat it later. Or if it's a rainy night, we'll have a couple of things to eat if you can't hunt. Might notice these feathers here. These are bluebird feathers. Uh, Eastern screech owls do eat a lot of bluebirds, apparently. At least I find the feathers in the boxes often. Here's another photograph I took just the other day, uh, looking down into a box from the top, and you'll see the uh, this is a gray faced screech owl, and then you'll see this um, song sparrow. And apparently, the night before, it, I was out hunting and was not hungry, but still wanted to kill a couple of things for later and took this song sparrow. And they do eat birds, they eat roosting birds. So at night, all the birds you see at your feeder and you see in your forest and your fields, they have to go to roost, all the songbirds. And as they're sleeping, screech owls can find them and of course pick them off. Now, 
They probably don't get very many because most of those birds stay very quiet and don't move. And But as soon as a bird moves, the owl might detect it. One thing you notice in all these shots I've shown you so far, the owls will typically lay it up against the side of the box, sometimes even facing it like this one with their eyes closed. Now, I open this box up. This bird is not sleeping. He is wide awake. But again, keeping those eyes closed, it feels it has the best chance of remaining camouflaged and it won't move. They don't move at all. And I'm, uh, you know, my fate, my camera is probably about a foot from it and they'll just stay right in the box. Now you don't want to bang it too much, but still they almost never flush out of the boxes. They just say that they figure their best bet is just to remain motionless and the predator might not notice them. Here's that same box, a different bird, although it is still a gray face, different time of year because it has nestlings. And if you look in, uh, if I use my cursor, I'll put that on, on the, the head of a couple of these birds, the nestlings. There's an eye, there's an eye, and there's a bill. Down here, same thing, eye, eye, bill. But it's kind of hard to tell that they're actually birds. It looks like just a clump of feathers. And that's probably an adaptation for predation. A predator finds them, and you know, if they don't move, and they typically don't, um, predator might leave them alone. Did you notice the bird doing the same thing, leaning up against the side? You notice this bird has a little more red or buff in it. So maybe it, it, it has some interbreeding with the red face. Also, notice the bluebird feathers again. Very common. That's probably because bluebirds are, are, are common in our area. They're also a bird that likes to roost in cavities. So they go into a tree cavity or they go into a, a nest box or something, and the screech owl might go in and find them. Apparently they do. Screech owls will also go into wood duck boxes. This is a plastic wood duck box. And if you, you know, you know where these boxes are, they're in, in Delaware here or any wildlife area, you're going to see a lot of wood duck boxes. I always take my time and look closely at the entrance just to make sure there's not an owl sticking his head out. And then, of course, in this case, there was. Sometimes you find them in buildings, and like this was one. This is a, uh, there were actually two, but this is one of them that would roost in a pipe in an old building um, down here um, near Hocas in Delaware. And he was there every night, every day at about 3.30, he would come up to the entrance to just the sun. Here's another, I'm gonna play their call. Of course, all of our owls call and you can identify them by their call. So I'm gonna play the call of the Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, and if you have your sound up, you should hear it. Sort of a couple of different types of trills. Some of you may have heard this. It's a really neat sound. But listen for it next time you're out in the forest. Next is a video of one calling. It's not a great video. Got I'm not a great, great videographer, but uh, it does show them calling. So. And if you, if you have your stand up loud enough, you hear the, uh, his relatives calling in the background. You look. <laughs> I assume there is relevance. We'll call one more time at the end of this video. Now that's something you don't get to see too much, uh, but every once in a while you can. Sometimes you'll find him out and in, in, in just perched on a branch in the middle of the day because not all of them go and find a roost before daylight ends. So they'll, they'll sometimes perch in a, especially an evergreen tree like this American holly or a spruce or a pine. And uh, every, every once in a while, you'll see them just perched there. Next species is the great horned owl. And then again, another common species found throughout the mid-Atlantic, it typically likes larger, tracks of woodlands and usually more mature woodlands. 
Um, so if you have a mature woodlands nearby, typically you have a great horned owl in it, or a family of great horned owls. So this is the uh, you know deciduous forest. Uh, they're common in deciduous forests. As you move south and on the on the uh, mid Atlantic, you know, you hit more pine forests, loblolly pines, and they're pretty common in those type habitats, especially if there's salt marsh around them. This is a very large owl. Um, it's, it's not our largest, but it's it's definitely our largest re resident bird. It is a powerful predator. It can eat um, animals the size of a skunk. So you might want to be careful if you're walk, walking your Yorkshire Terrier out there you know, along a wood edge. Although I've never had one, never heard of one coming down and taking one. But they can take something a size of a cat um, and a small dog. Great horned owls tend to be nocturnal, but they do sometimes come out at dusk and dawn. This is one that popped out and landed conveniently in a tree for me because it's hard, sometimes it's difficult to photograph great horns because they are a little more nocturnal than most owls. So I'm going to try to, I have the call of the great horn, and I'm sure some of you have heard this. The deeper sound is the male, and the higher sound is the female. Now that might sound um, typical, <laughs> um, but it's it's interesting because although the male has the higher pitch, the lower pitch, he is smaller than the female. Females are female owls are usually a little bigger than the males. Owls don't nest in cavities; they nest in the open, usually. Um, they don't make their own nests, so they usually nest in uh, diurnal raptor nests. So red-tailed hawk, uh, red-shouldered hawk, an osprey, even bald eagle nest, they'll nest in. So they don't make their own. Uh, they're usually nest high up in a tree, not always, and that's primarily because that's where the hawks nest. Sometimes, though, they will make a nest in a crotch of a tree. A big, a large cavity in a tree. Um, I've seen them, and they, these are just young birds. You can hardly. This is an old photograph. You can just see the ear cuff here. There's one here, one here, and there's one back there. This is a, a, a pair of young, uh, almost fledglings, but still nestlings. They're on an osprey nest in a canal here in Delaware called the C and D Canal, and it's a great spot because you can actually. Uh, observe these owls through their whole uh, growing up in the nest because they're out in the water and they don't fear you as much because they I, I assume they they know that that water is protecting them we can't get out to them so they're out in the middle of the canal it's a great place to see these birds see the adults and the juveniles sometimes the the juveniles will jump out of the nest a little bit early a little before they can fly uh, as well as they might want to. Um, this is not a bad thing though, it happens pretty often. And the, fee the parents, the male and female, will take care of the bird that jumps out. So if you find one, I know our, we have a, a bird rescue uh, organization here in Delaware called Tri-State Bird Rescue. And they do get, you know, every spring they say they get a few great horned owls that people bring in. So if you find one, leave it where it is, unless it's in really danger. A dangerous area, say a parking lot or a road. And uh, people ask me, how do I find owls? Um, and I, I like to say with difficulty, but I do look for them all the time, um, you know, casually sometimes, very aggressively others. So when I'm driving around this time of year or hiking around, I'm always looking in the tree branches that are, you know, almost bare now and looking for something that's just a little odd. I tell people, I don't look for owls. I look for things that don't look like they should be there. So here's something right here. Now that could turn out to be, uh, I don't know, a squirrel nest. It could turn out to be a bag that blew up there. And often it is, but sometimes it turn out to be, turns out to be an owl. Here's another case. There's one right here. Again, I just kind of noticed this little blob over here. I was actually further away when I saw it, but can see it when well, my cursor's not working very well. Um, and here's a close-up of that same bird. 
So look for, we all, we're always looking for something out of the ordinary. And usually it's vertical. Most branches are horizontal. So anything that looks a little bit uh, vertical, we're, we kind of stop, take our binoculars out and look at it. Another resident owl, and you probably, I'm sure all of you have seen a photo or something of this bird. This is a common or commonly used bird in, in uh, movies and things. This is the barn owl, Beto alba. Beautiful owl. It's different than the other owls. In fact, barn owls are in their, their own group. There's two varieties of owls. There's the barn owls and a close relative called the bay owl, and then all the other owls. So there's two groups of owls. The barn owls make up number one. The barn owl is an owl of open land. And on down here in Delmarva, they tend to like, uh, prefer to be along the salt marshes. Very open territories, lots of meadow voles out there, things to eat. They also associated with agriculture. So in Pennsylvania, um, there's a lot of agriculture and other states out in Midwest, they associate with large fields. And they also associate with agricultural buildings. Not necessarily a home like this, but barns, silos, things like that. In fact, we find them often in barns and silos. In fact, I look in them all the time. Um, I go down our coast and I'll ask the farmer if I can look in his silo or his barn. And often there's a barn owl in it. Just one in a, in a, in a side of a, a, a kind of a big shed. Here's one in a silo. And you can picture me looking in the bottom of the silo, looking up at him, and he's just staring down at me. They also nest in old buildings, uh, like lighthouses, churches. However, nowadays, uh, most, most active buildings, like a church or a school, a steeple or something like that, they, um, they, put preventative, they take preventative measures keep animals out of the steeples or out of those buildings. So in other words, they put screen up, primarily to keep the bats out, I, I guess. But um, so recently you don't see as many owls in old buildings as you did, unless the building is abandoned, like this, like this lighthouse. But instead of that, people or wildlife biologists and others are putting up nest boxes for them. So what they do, they find uh, any kind of shed, doesn't have to be old, this is a brand new shed for our Delaware Fish and Wildlife. And the biologists uh, installed this nest box. This particular nest box is on the outside and you can see the hole where the, the owl would enter. And this is just an access so that you can clean it out when you need to. But the owls will nest in these boxes and roost. You know. Here's, here's an owl looking out. This is a box that was placed on the inside of the shed of a, of a building, and they just cut a little hole into the box. And this barn owl uh, responded to me squeaking out there outside it. I was out sitting in my car about, I don't know, about 30 feet away, and I squeaked and it stuck his head out and looked at me, and I was able, well, I was ready with my camera, and I was able to get a photograph. Inside those boxes, uh, I have uh, participated on surveys of the boxes, so I've, I've been able to look inside. And um, certain times of the year, I, I, right around January, you start to see the young birds, the eggs, and then the young birds. In this photograph, you see one nestling, a brand new nestling. He's probably had this guy probably hatched about three days before I photographed it. This guy about two, and there's still an egg here. So there was there was at least four birds in there, and I was able to kind of follow this nest box um, through the season because I was doing the surveys. And here's one. Of them. This was actually the runt, the last guy to leave the nest. Didn't want to disturb him very much, but when every, all the other guys left, there was just one left, and I was able to get some photos. And you can still see the young bird. It's got that's got some pretty good size. He's almost full grown, but he still has these little fluffy feathers, little down feathers. And he'll lose them. And he lost them pretty quickly. The next week I went down, well, not this one, this is an earlier shot. Um, but it just shows that that typical strange heart-shaped face. Some, some liken it to a monkey, um, but all the down all around it. And a week later, he looked like this. I went back and he had actually left the box, but was still in the shed. And uh, he still has, or he or she, I'm not sure what sex. 
Uh, still has a few fluffy feathers, but it's lost most of them. And I'm sure this bird was gonna leave the shed that night. And if you look real close, you'll see a, a band here. All the barn owls were banded by a gentleman named Wayne Lehman in Delaware anyway. And he had hundreds of boxes up all through this, all through the uh, state. This is a, a telltale sign of barn owls. When you look outside one of these boxes and you see a bunch of skulls and pellets, you know that there's barn owls in there. Um, this, is, this is one I photographed that just had an amazing amount of skulls. Well, these birds were eating a lot of meadow birds, a lot. And of course it must have reared a few young. Made for a neat photo. Here's two birds uh, in a shed. They, all, they also hang around the buildings because if you know farms, they usually have grain stored or they're, or they're growing grain and rodents are attracted to that grain. So they will hunt the sheds and the barns and around the, and around the outside of them. And this is a photograph I just got lucky, drove up to one of these sheds and before they, they, they uh, flew, I got a photograph of it. Now here's one in flight. It's a neat photo. It's a bit artificial. You're almost never going to see a barn owl fly in the daytime. Never. They're nocturnal birds almost entirely. This bird was flushed out of this barn. You know, this was a, a farm that I knew the farmer very well. And I would go down every once in a while. On this particular visit, I went down. I saw it out in the building, in the barn. And uh, then I noticed that the farmer wanted to drive his tractor in there to do some work. So I, I asked him if he could just wait a second until I got in position. Because I kind of tried to guess where it was going to leave that barn. And sure enough, it came right out the hole right where I was. So I got a photograph. And there he is flying by. Um, again, you're not going to see this typically unless it's accidentally flushed. Now, this bird, usually when they flush, they just fly around and go right back in. And that's what this bird did. He went into actually the neighborhood silo. I'm going to play the call of the uh, barn owl. Uh, this one may be uh, heard a lot, but usually not recognized because it's usually they're calling at night and over open areas. Not very musical. If you go down to salt marshes at night, especially late at night, often hear this. Okay, the last owl that is a resident in the, in the Mid-Atlantic is the barn owl. And it's a well-known owl. It's, what, it's a large owl, although he's mostly feathers. He's a very light bird compared to his, uh, his apparent, apparent look. But they're found along floodplains, lowland areas, uh, throughout the Piedmont and along the coast. As you go down to Mid-Atlantic, the more swampy areas, they're very common in swamps wooded swamps, even cypress swamps are extremely, if you've ever gone south to uh, the Carolinas or even south in Delaware, Trap Pond State Park, um, you'll hear these guys calling all night if you're camping. And they do call, they call in the daytime and at night, and they have a very uh, well-known call. Uh, it has a mnemonic. Mnemonic is when you put English or, well, I guess you could put any kind of words to it, words to the sound. So the, the words that have been put to this bird's call is, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? I'm gonna play the call. Really a neat sound. And one that, again, you hear in the middle of the night, sometimes in the middle of the day. These, like I said, they're large birds in appearance, but they actually hunt small prey. They typically hunt uh, frogs, small snakes, small rodents. They rarely take large prey. Every once in a while, they'll take a squirrel. I've seen them take squirrels. And they're a cavity nester. They tend to like large openings to their cavity like this. Uh, particular one here is a parent and a young bird. There's two fledged uh, nestlings that are Pretty big, so they're going to fledge fairly soon in a large cavity. You can install nest boxes for them, um, but um, I haven't 
I haven't done that yet. I'd like to do that and see if it works. Here's a juvenile. And you can talk to juvenile because he still has that rough kind of head, that fluffy head. Juveniles can be real inquisitive. And sometimes this bird actually, I was actually working out in the yard and it just flew up and started looking at me. It just sat there for the longest while. So I went in and got my camera, came back out and took a picture. Finally, the parent came in, squawked at it, and then they both flew away. So let's start talking about the winter birds, a short eared owl, one of them. This is a bird that comes down from the north and the, and the northwest uh, west of here. Again, another open area bird. It likes our salt marshes. Parts of its range in the Midwest, it likes the open prairie and agricultural lands. This is a bird that actually is kind of interesting and, and it's really neat for photographers because this bird will fly when there's light. So it flies in the morning and the afternoon. And if you get the right nights, uh, the right days where it's very, very bright and about 3.30, 4 o'clock, you still get that low sun. Sometimes you'll see these birds hunting over the salt marshes um, around Delaware. Now you can see these, uh, I know people see them at the Philadelphia airport hunting, anywhere there's open land. Quite handsome birds, you can identify them uh, by this, you know, the light under color of the wings and this very dark crescent. I don't know if you can see that, my cursor's not leaving. There you go, that crescent there. Also, when they're flying out there, they tend to look, if they're farther out, and this, you can see the head in this photograph, but if, usually if you're looking with naked eye or even if they're far out with binoculars, I look for a bird that has no head. Because there's another bird that flies at the same time as this, and that's the Northern Harrier or the Marsh Hawk. So you got to differentiate from the two. And a bird that has no head almost looks like a cigar. I'm going to play a short video. It shows them, shows one hunting over the marsh. These kind of fly very lightly over the marsh. Some say butterfly like until well, they hear something. Boom, he must have heard something, jumped down. And this particular bird didn't get anything on that on that approach. They do have a call. Um, it's not very musical. Uh, and you can hear it on, on the salt marshes and again in the morning and afternoon, sometimes at night. Uh, this shot does show a little bit of the so-called short ear. Now, of course, the ears aren't really ears, they're just tufts of feathers. Kind of a bark. If you don't hear it that often, it's not a very common sound unless you spend a lot of time in the salt marshes. There's one perch. They will perch for you uh, once in a while. And some of them, uh, it's funny, you know, some of the, the birds, individuals are very tolerant and you can get fairly close if you have a big lens. Um, other birds spook very quickly. So you have to, well, you want to respect the owls. You don't want to get too close to them. You don't want to unnecessarily make them fly. Um, excessively, uh, you know, you spook one once, it's not that big a deal, but if, you know, 10, 15 people do spook them, it can, yeah, they run, they can use up a lot of energy trying to get away. In, in today's world with so many photographers out there with digital cameras, um, there has been some issues of, of overzealous photographers getting a little too close and, and somewhat harassing the birds. The long eared out, and it does have long ear tufts. See them up here? Nice and long, even longer than the great horned owl. This is a bird that comes down from the north. There are records in Pennsylvania of it nesting in north central Pennsylvania, but it's scarce up there. There's a shot of one that usually, when you find them, they're almost always in heavy cover. So it's kind of hard to find them. You got to be looking. And I remember very well the day I saw this thing. And all I saw was something odd up in the tree. Again, I wasn't really looking for an owl. And of course, this is a magnified shot. So I was just seeing a little thing that looked different than those pine needles. And lucky for me, it was a long eared owl. They can move those ears. And they do flap them back when they fly. 
because if they had them straight out, then there'd be a lot of wind resistance. This, this bird was in hand when I photographed it. It actually had been injured. It survived. It, it was taken to uh, rehab. But at the time, it, it was kind of scared, so I put his ears back. But here's typically how you see them with a lot of branches. And of course, it kind of frustrates photographers because it's hard to get a focus. But I always just, I don't worry about the sticks. I just kind of focus right through and uh, hopefully get the eyes because they have magnificent eyes. And this is how hard they are to see. This is one that was along a road that I was, um, I had heard it was somewhere up there. So we were driving along and um, all of a sudden my, my wife actually said, look, I think that might be there. And all she was looking for was just something a little odd. It's right here. Again, most of the branches are, ver are horizontal or drooping down in this case, or drooping up slightly. But something that has verticality, you always want to check it out. And that particular, that, that's what this turned out to be this guy. So I was able to get this shot. He was really undercover. But I did get a little bit of an eye and a little bit of ear tuft. Longer owls are, I think, probably my favorite owl. Here's one that was out in the open, which is rare, but as it shows you the whole body plan, the nice big facial disc that most owls have. And that disc, actually use, uh, kind of works as a parabolic to funnel sound to the ears. This is the call. And it's pretty neat, but I've never, uh, well, long-eared owls feed on white-footed mice and other small mice, white-footed, uh, sometimes jumping mice, meadow jumping mice. I had never heard a long-eared owl call because they don't breed here. Um, and they typically don't call in the winter when they're wintering. Uh, but just three weeks ago, I finally had one in my yard calling. And I didn't see them, but I could hear them and I taped them. This is a this is a typical long-eared owl roost site. This is one at one of our preserves at the Delaware Nature Society called the Coverdale Farm Preserve. And we let this cedar tree, this cedar knoll grow up years ago. And we get long-eared owls in there just about every year. So they like that dense cover. Here's one from that, that knoll. And you can notice his, his ears are back. That's because I had, I had crawled through the vegetation. When I stood up, he was right there. I didn't notice him. And I spooked him. So he was getting ready to fly. So he put his ears back. He stayed there long enough for me to photograph that. This is one we found last year. It only had one ear. It was really strange. We still don't know what the deal was. <laughs> The Solwet Owl. This is our smallest owl. Uh, this is or the northern Solwet Owl, more proper. This is a bird that comes down from the boreal forest, although they do nest in the highlands in Virginia, in the mountains of Virginia and West Virginia. Um, so they do, and they actually there are nesting uh, areas in Pennsylvania, high, higher altitudes. They're a gorgeous little bird, smaller than our screech owl, so they stand about five inches tall. And typically we find them when they're wintering underneath cover. So they like to go underneath uh, kind of a top, something that covers their, their body. So this is a, just a tangle of vegetation. This looks like honeysuckle and all the floor rose and everything. And you notice the snow on it, that's probably why they like it. Because where they're from, it snows a lot. And if you're underneath this sort of thing, it'll protect you from the snowfall and rain. Here's one again underneath cover. This is not as thick. The red eyes, though, in this guy is a function of flash. It's not, that's, they don't have red eyes. They have yellow eyes. And we often find soil wets and other owls by looking for owl sign. Here's a pellet here. Here's some, what we call this whitewash, which is ureic acid that the owls defecate. So they regurgitate the pellet and defecate that. So if we see this on an, underneath a tree, we'll often look up and hopefully we'll find an owl. Here's a group uh, looking at a very uh, typical Solwet owl tree. They're usually relatively short trees. Old Christmas tree farms work great for this. That's what this was at one time. So this is a group that we're looking in there. Um, we found them and then some this person here is pointing them out. They're all, even when you find them, they're hard to see because they're usually in dense vegetation. But they're very tame. They allow you to get very close. So um, if you, you know, as you don't get too close or you don't touch them, they usually just sit there and look at you. That's a beautiful guy here. 
So the call, they have a really interesting call. They do call once in a while in the winter, um, but on their nesting ground, they call all summer. Reminds me of like the old uh, submarine movies, the sonar. They also make this call. So when you're out in the woods at night uh, during the winter, listen for that. You might hear it. Here's another one. This one, you notice he's not looking at me um, because when I found him was in the actually in March. It was just migrating north probably, and it stopped over to feed, and it was feeding on wood frogs. I was out that night photographing wood frogs, and I happened to see the saw wet uh, jumping down and grabbing them, eating them, and then and going back up in the perch. Me. Typically, they probably eat mostly rodents. The last uh, of eight that I'm going to show you is a well-known bird called the snowy owl. Snowy owls are um, um, a bird from the Arctic. They their nest far beyond all the other owls um, in a treeless habitat. They rarely come down here in any numbers. Because most of them, most of the time, they just winter up there. They come, to, they winter along lakes, like um, or or large, like the Hudson Bay, um, where there are water fish, in particular eider ducks. And eiders will stay up there and keep an area of these large bodies of water open. And the snowy owls will set up little territories all along those ponds, all those lakes, and at night pick off the 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 uh, ducks. Now, some years, they, they erupt, and lots of them come south. And they do that on years when the, their food prey, which is the lemming, you may have heard of those guys. Lemming is, um, has a population explosion in the summertime. When that happens, there are millions of these lemmings on the, on the tundra. And the snowy owl can feed its young so well that it can have as many as 12 young. When that happens, you have a surplus of snowy owls, to say the least. So many that they don't have enough places to hunt up there in the Arctic. So they have to, the young birds, the usually birds of the year, move south. And sometimes, and when they move south, they have to go beyond the boreal forest, which is most of Canada, in Canada. And they have to come down below the boreal forest to the prairie or in our case, to our salt marshes or agricultural fields. And they do. Every seven years, we'll get a few owls. Here's one that's perched up on a, in a marsh. They really do like salt marshes. They feed on meadow voles and ducks. We look for snowy owls all the time in the winter, us birders. Um, we're always looking in open fields for anything white that looks like an owl, like this thing. Typically, it turns out to be a white paper bag or a balloon or something. But every once in a while, it's a snowy owl. You'll find them along salt marshes, on the edges of estuaries. This is a young male, look how dark he is. The older he gets, the whiter he'll get. He'll never get pure white like the female does, but he'll get much whiter than this. Here's one, this looks like a young female. She's out in a salt marsh. They will perch on human structures. This is a transformer, like again, a male probably. Rooftops, you name it, they'll nest on, uh, they'll roost on. Usually not something too tall. Rarely found in trees though, because where they're from, there are no trees. This is a bird during our year, about five, six years ago, that came down uh, near our Delaware, uh, Delaware River. And this bird liked to, just spend a day on this light standard in a parking lot. It was pretty neat. You could see him every day. He rarely opened his eyes, though. He's always just squinting at us. Because again, they open their eyes, they're going to give away themselves. Here's a young male. And I'm going to play the call, the snowy. I've never heard this call because they usually, apparently, they don't call in the winter. I've never been to the Arctic.
course, the, I, th I think the neatest place to find an owl is in dunes. And they do. This is where they show up probably most of the time in Delaware anyway, and up the coast. They really like the open dunes because they can, uh, there's a lot of ducks around usually in the ocean. Uh, eider ducks are out there, um, scoters and things. And also it makes for a really good fish. I got this bird. I shot this bird very, very early in the morning. The sun just popped up. So he had just got done hunting. Um, in fact, he might have been still going to do a little hunting. Sometimes they will hunt in the daytime. Because they're, you know, they're used to the daylight when they're nesting, it's daylight all the time. But he opened his eyes and, uh, or had his eyes open it. So I got a hefty surprise. Now I'm going to show you a few other birds. I'm not going to talk too much about them. They've never been found in our area, but they have been found in the Middle Atlantic. This bird is the Boreal Owl. It was found in Central Park about, oh gosh, I'm going to say 15 years ago, 12 years ago. So a, a lot of birds, it's, excuse me, it stayed there a while. Um, so we, we uh, made a pilgrimage up to Manhattan from Staten Island. And this is my family. It's my sons. Now they're first a lot older, 28, 26. Now my wife and uh, a birder named Jeff Gordon, you may have heard of. He's a, um, a very well-known birder. He used to be the president of the ABA, American Birding Association. So we went up there, set up our scopes um, in Central Park and it quick, quickly attracted a crowd, as you might expect. And we, were, we had a lot of fun showing him the bird and just talking to them. Here he is again. And they, they have a really neat call. I've never heard this because I think you have to go up to the boreal forest to hear it. Really interesting, somewhat like the saw wet. And actually they look a little bit like the saw wet out. They're the same genus. So I'm gonna show you pictures of both. This is a boreal owl on your left. And you notice it has a light beige colored bill, sometimes yellowish. The saw wet is a black bill. So the moral of the story is, if you ever see something that looks like a saw wet and has a yellow bill, give me a call. Because that would be a really great find. We call them mega birds. So we haven't found one yet. In Delaware yet. I don't know about Pennsylvania. Uh, a couple others. This is the bird that showed up one time in Delaware, in the Mid-Atlantic. This is a burrowing owl. This is a bird that has a populations in Florida and then in the Midwest all the way out to California. We believe that the bird, bird we saw uh, at Bombay Hook was a bird from the Midwest because they're migratory, but Florida birds are not. These birds nest in the ground. Some of you may have seen them in Florida or in the Midwest. Really, really fun birds. But um, the likelihood of getting another one is pretty remote here. So I don't really include them in my um, eight owls. Another bird that we love to get here is the Northern Hawk Owl. This is a photograph I took when I was a very young man and had um, didn't have the resources to buy a very good camera. So I had a pretty Tinsy lens here. It's called a hawk owl. Uh, I did uh, the only photograph I, I took two photos from the web uh, just to show you what they really look like. Here's one here. Someday I'm going to get a photograph just like this. They're a great bird. They're from the boreal forest, but they rarely come south. Um, they, they have been in New York. I think they've been in Pennsylvania, but never in Delaware or south of here. Another one is a great gray owl. This is the largest looking owl of all of our owls, but it's mostly feathers. It's a lot of fluff. Um, they come down, they've been in, they have been in New York and they have been uh, in Vermont, I believe. Um, probably a stretch to think they might come down this far south, but if you go to Northern Pennsylvania, you never know, in an eruption year, you could get them. Here's what they really, again, I, this is another photograph that I borrowed. We're just birds. I've seen them, and they're more, much more common in Minnesota and Nebraska, places like that. So that's the end of my show. Um, I would entertain some questions um, if you have any. Let me stop my share. Uh, Amy, you out there still? Oh, there she's. All right. <laughs> Jim, that was awesome. Um, there's so many really cool owls that we're able to see in our region. So thank you for teaching us all about them and 
letting us hear their calls as well. Um, so everyone, will, we're taking questions now. And again, there's the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom that you can put your questions in that section and we will, I will read them out to Jim. So our first question is, um, actually came in when you were showing the owl boxes with yes. the screech owls. Um, Anne is asking that we've had an owl box for about 10 years and can't seem to get a resident. Box faces west in an open field and we hear owls nearby. Any tips to encourage them to come? Um, I Well, one question would be, do you have a predator guard? In other words, uh, a, a guard on that post or however you have it um, that will prevent raccoons from, from uh, climbing up. The other is, are you sure you don't have them now? Because I showed you pictures of them in the in the in the um, in the opening, but they could be in there and not sitting that sit in that opening. Um, so um, I and maybe you do this already, but I would go out every once in a while and open the box to look, because if you have them in your area, I would doubt that they go in there from time to time. They might not nest. It's not that common that they nest in the box. But I, if I had to bet, I bet there's a bird that comes in your box every once in a while. Um, it sounds like you have it perfectly placed, so I can't give you any other um, any other tips there. So uh, I think I think you just wait and check your box to see. Some owls just um, they don't have that. They don't need. They don't want to go up in that box entrance. So I believe this is the same person who says no. They don't have a predator guard. So I guess that's something to look into. Yeah, predator guards are good, um, and uh, I, I put them on my boxes here. Someone was asking more about the the boxes, um, asking what material do you line the box with, or is no. that material gathered from the birds? No, they don't gather any material. You really don't need material in there. Um, if you know if some of my photos, you would probably see shavings, wood shavings, but they're in there for wood ducks because they were wood duck boxes. Um, I typically do not put any uh, anything in my in my screech out boxes. I just leave them straight up like the way they are. Okay, great. And there's another question about when you're opening the door to the boxes, I know you talked a little bit about how they face and try to um, pretend that they're not in there, um, but are do you think that the owls are afraid when you open, open and go into the, into the boxes? Oh, sure, they're afraid. I mean, um, and afraid is a human term, but yeah, they're on high alert. And way, the way I open the box is very carefully, very slowly, because the bird could be leaning up against the, op the box that you're opening, part you're opening. So it's, it's not usually the case, they're usually on the back, but I do it very, very quietly. I open it very slowly and I, I try not to keep it open too long. Um, as, as short as possible. And I just take a couple pictures and then shut it and walk away. And again, I rarely have them flush. I rarely do. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, how high do you think the boxes should yeah, be? Yeah, that's a good question. I like to say about eight feet high is optimal. I've seen them in lower boxes, but I, I put them about eight feet, but not too high because you wanna be able to put a, a relatively small ladder to be up and get it and check them, check the boxes. So you don't want them too old. Okay. So thinking about your your yard and backyard and attracting owls, um, someone says that if you're a dog owner, are owls less likely to come to your yard? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I've always had a dog in mind. They come to mind. I guess if you let your dog run, run underneath the box a lot, you know, you had a fenced in yard and the box was within the fence, that may dis discourage them. Uh, but I don't have that here. You know, my dog runs around the box, but only when I'm out there. So, right. Um, someone, it's I like all these box questions. It's yeah. everyone's kind of feeding off of each other. Um, now someone's asking, where would you get oh. an owl box? Yeah, you can buy them online. I mean, most of the bird feed stores sell them. You can make them. You can find the the, the plans very easily online. Um, but you can buy them also. They're all pre-made. So they're very common. Just go on the internet and put screech owl box and boom, you'll get a billion things to pop up. Okay, perfect. Um, I absolutely love that photo that you took of all of the, the skulls on the underneath yeah. that tree. That was amazing. 
Um, and this person's asking that they heard that owls and hawks eat the head of prey first. Is this true and why would that be? Well, again, most owls, depending on if the, if the food is small enough, will eat, eat it head first, but entire, won't pull the head off. Um, uh, so they'll just swallow the whole thing. Now, mm -hmm. hawks, red tail hawks, red shoulders, they often just tear the head off. I don't know why and eat that first. I don't, I don't know why that is. Um, but owls typically swallow it head first. I mean, head first, but the whole thing. Right. This is just a comment back to the bird. Those of you out there who are interested in um, owl boxes, um, someone commented that Willis Town Conservation Trust has a bird box program for township residents. So I, if you're local to us and listening and might be in that township, um, that's, a, that's a little, hopefully a little helpful tip. For you yeah that is that's another point yeah you can contact your local um conservation organization especially if they're bird oriented and they'll be able to help you and sometimes even supply boxes mm -hmm. great i was wondering i was in, interested in your comment about the barn owls kind of being in their own group and then the rest of the owls being in another group um do you know the reasoning um, yeah, well, why they're anatomy. separated out it's anatomy. Okay. Um, they just have a very different anatomy, head anatomy, skull anatomy than the all the other owls. Um, and DNS, is, DNS, yeah, DNA has confirmed that too. So uh, it, it, it's interesting because some authors believe that there's only one species of barn owl throughout the world, and all of them are just subspecies. Right. Like, and then other authors believe they're all different species. And then the bay owl, which is a little bit different, it's a tropical owl, um, and there's only a couple of species of those. They have that same heart-shaped face, but they're very dark in color. But they're related. Okay, wonderful. Those questions came in fast and furious. Um, hey. Are there any anyone else out there with questions for Jim tonight? We'll give them another moment. So I actually was going to ask you what your favorite owl was, but you answered it in the presentation. Long so long years, huh? Yeah, but that could change. <laughs> right, depending on the like, day. It's kind of like my children. You know, I have a favorite child <laughs> this month, and the next month it's someone. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the long years have been that way for a while. Of course, if I'm standing in front of a snowy owl, I, uh, I'm not complaining. <laughs> right, so, yeah. right. Wonderful. They're all exciting. They're all very exciting. That's the neat thing about owls is when you see one, you get excited and you, it's hard to help it. You know, it's mm -hmm. I don't know why. I'm not sure why, but it really. So just to understand a little bit more about kind of their yearly cycle. So we heard a lot of owls calling at Jenkins, um, you know, in the in the fall, little even like later fall, we did an owl prowl. Um, one night to go out uh, listening. And is that because, are they calling to mate? Is that what they're doing in the fall? Yeah, they call for a couple of reasons. One is to uh, communicate with their mate. So in other words, you're just kind of t telling each other where they are when they're out hunting. Um, but if, yeah, if, if, if a bird, if a young bird doesn't have a mate, that bird will set up a territory, the male will set up a territory and he'll call in hopes to attract the mate. But they also set up, you know, they're also defending territories mm. when they call. And if you hear them really calling, you know, getting into it, it's usually that they're it's two adults getting uh, defending their territory. They, they don't really fight. They just kind of have this shouting match, so to speak. But you start, you hear them a lot in the fall, and then you hear them again in January, January, February. So um, the, the great horns owl are the first ones to nest, and they'll start nesting in late December. And then the others follow suit all the way around. You know, so the ones that have to migrate north a little later. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that for me. <laughs> One question came in. I'm just reading it real quick before I say it out loud. It looks like they find found a pile of pellets in a quantity of hundreds. Could this be from sawwet owls? Uh, no, uh, hundreds, wow. 
Um, it depends. Well, one more thing is look at the size of the pellet. The larger the bird, the bigger the pellet. That's it's very easy. Saw wets have very small pellets. Um, hundreds. I've never found hundreds of saw wet. Um, I have found you know 25, 30 because they will roost in the same tree every night. Um, the only time I've ever found hundreds is in barn owls, and they're huge, big pellets. You know, they're they're about like that, almost two and a half inches. So I, it's hard to say. If they had a photo, they could send it to me. Um, I'd look at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. All right. We did get another question in about the box. So um, they were talking more about setting up the box to attract an owl and how to do it. So. It sounds like at least from what I've learned from you tonight, um, eight feet off the ground, right? We would look on the internet for a place to either purchase a owl box or to find the um, schematics online to build your own. Um, and then kind of, again, eight feet off the ground and you you encourage people to face it west westward on because of uh, where how the sun hits it. And I, I don't know that the owls need that. It's just that you see them more. <laughs> when oh, they do. okay. <laughs> and I usually place them on the edge of the woods. On the edge so of woods. Not deep right. in the woods and not out in the middle of the field in the edge. I see someone saw a snowy owl last winter in, in Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut is a great owl state, especially along the coast. Yeah, I saw my first boreal owl in Connecticut. Yes, my sister lives in Connecticut and they uh, recently within the last year saw a snowy themselves so that was really exciting for them exciting uh, this person was commenting more on the question with the owl pilot that they there were about seven to eight owls at that time flushed out and they oh. seemed like they were on the smaller side just a bit larger than a screech owl. So that's uh, maybe where they were thinking it might have been a saw. I would, I would call them long-eared owls because long-eared owls are probably uh, the only one that nests in groups and family groups in the winter. And you can get seven, eight, nine birds in one woods, one tight woods. So I would guess the birds you're saying saw were long-eared owls. That'd be my guess. Okay. It's fun. It's like, you know, being more of a plant person, getting the plant ID questions on the fly. You're trying to identify uh, owls on the fly from uh, owl pellets. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a naturalist, you love to identify things. I mean, yes. Whatever your specialty is. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Well, everyone is saying thank you so much. And they really enjoy this presentation. And I would echo their sentiments, Jim. This was wonderful tonight. Thank you for being with us and sharing all of your incredible information. And um, for all of you who are still with us, thank you so much for joining. Um, a couple of people have asked about the presentation uh, and it, yes, it has been recorded and will be shared. I was just getting my second laptop back up so I can remember. Um, our next lecture, our next third Thursday lecture next month on December 15th, we're going to be um, the topic is celebrating the seasons of a Pennsylvania garden. So we're going to shift from owls and we're going to go back into, into the garden. Um, and that's with Donald Pell. So again, that's next month, December 15th at 7 p.m. And hopefully you guys can join us for that one as well. And Jim, again, thank you so much for being with us. Very welcome. So, yeah. And hopefully we'll see everyone again soon. Take care. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.